Lord, help them to hear and help them to understand. And Lord, help them to respond to you and to your word. Lord, that their needs might be met this morning. There are folks here today that are lost. If they were to die right now, they would be cast into hell. And in hell, they'd spend eternity. And Lord, you love them. You don't want them to go to that awful place of torment. And we ask that the Holy Ghost of God would convict them today and trouble them. And Lord, draw them, uh, help them to come to Jesus today. Or give them an opportunity to be saved. And Lord, help them to realize what a great opportunity that is. And Lord, help them to humble their hearts and come to Jesus. And Lord, there are Christians here this morning as well that need to hear from you, God. Not, not a pastor, not a sermon, not an outline. But God, they need you to speak to their heart. They come this morning saying, Oh God, speak to me. And Lord, if, if you will help us, they'll hear your voice. Lord, just help me not to get in your way. And I, I pray, God, for those Christians that have been doing well, and they've matured, and they have grown. God, that you'd give them some bread from heaven, some meat, some food to eat today that would help them take some steps closer to you because of the work of the Spirit of God in this service. Lord, they not leave today empty and without being fed, but they would be fed today. Lord, please accomplish your will here in this service as your will is accomplished in heaven and glorify your name. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. Isaac was the only uh, son of Abraham and Sarah. You may remember that the Bible teaches us that Abraham uh, had eight sons all together. In Genesis 16, Abraham had a child with Hagar. His name was Ishmael. And then in Genesis 21, uh, Abraham and Sarah in their old age, uh, Sarah is pregnant and Isaac is a gift from God uh, to a barren womb at uh, the age of 90. Sarah has a child. And then here in Genesis chapter 25, at the beginning of this chapter, Abraham remarries, and his wife is Keturah, and they have six sons. Those sons' names are listed in verse 2, Zimram, and Jokshan, and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua. That wasn't too bad, right? <laughs> if y'all are reading that, you say, Preacher, oh, you usually struggle with that. That wasn't too bad. Uh, two or three hours of practice, you, you can get them names out pretty good. Anyway, uh, some of you don't know that Abraham went on to have more children, but that is what the Bible records. But out of these eight sons, Isaac was the only promised child. Promised child in the sense that through him, through Abraham, and through his seed, the Messiah, Christ Jesus, would come into the world. When you read the Gospels of Matthew and Luke and also, John, you'll see the, uh, how Christ came into the earth and his uh, lineage is recorded in Matthew and Luke and you can trace it all the way back to Abraham and Isaac. In fact, uh, Luke, I think, traces all the way back to Adam and Eve. Amen? So out of all these eight sons, he's the only one. And Isaac and, Be and Rebekah have been married for 20 years. He got married when he was 40 and now he's 60 years old. You'll see that also in this text of Genesis chapter 20. He's 60 years old. 20 years and they don't have a child. And the Christ is to come through them. And so what does Isaac do? He goes to the Lord and he entreats the Lord. He prays to God. He cries out to God. And the Lord hears his prayer and Rebecca has, is conceived. She has a child in her womb. And then the children begin to struggle. They're fighting even in the womb. <laughs> and she says, Lord, if you've given me a child, what is going on? I, I don't know what the struggle is. Why is there such conflict inside my womb? And she, like we all should do, 
She doesn't go to her husband. She doesn't go to the doctors. Who does she go to? She goes to the Lord. And she says, Lord, what is going on? And the Lord tells her, these are two children, and out of these children shall come two people or nations, and the first one that's born, the older, he will end up serving the younger. And this before they're even born. God says, Jacob, uh, he will be named, the younger will be, uh, uh, he will be over Esau. Now this is the point I want to make to you this morning. This was a promise before Jacob was even born, but what kind of man was Jacob? Jacob was a man that tried his best any way he could to get this blessing. Um, and he didn't, it didn't matter what tool that he used. He, he could use manipulation, he could use deception, he could use lying. Uh, he was really good at working out circumstances to try to get what he wanted. The problem is he did all of that for something that he already had. Right? I mean, before they were born, God said, Jacob is the, is the one that's going to be the, the chosen one that Christ is going to come through the world in. Wow. Esau didn't have a choice in that. Jacob didn't have a choice in that. And you say, preacher, why is that? Well, out of these eight nations, one of them had to bring the Messiah, right? Yeah. Out of these twin boys, these two boys that were born, probably never twins looked so different than these two yeah. twins did when they were first born, but out of these two, could you have two messiahs coming into the world? It had to be only one that would be the one that would have the line of the messiah. Why? Because there's only one messiah. There's only one savior. There's only one redeemer. So a choice, a decision has to be made. Who makes the decision? Who makes the choice? God does. And he chooses Jacob, you're, the, you're going to be the one that I'm going to add my blessing to. But before we even get out of this verse, we see how Jacob began to try to get everything to go in his way. Yeah. We, we, we don't even get out of this chapter. Look at verse 29. And Jacob sawed pottage. He's boiling, cooking pottage. And Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, this is uh, Genesis 25, verse 30, I pray thee with that same red pottage for, uh, feed me, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. You're the oldest. Everything's supposed to go to you. All that heritage and the blessing that's coming through Abraham, through Isaac, down to us. Jacob said, Won't, won't you sell that to me? And here Esau could care less about the blessings of God or God or anything else. All he wanted to do was satisfy his flesh. And so he agrees to sell the birthright to Jacob for just a bowl of soup. Can I say something to you? People went to hell for far less than that. Amen? His manipulation doesn't stop there. Later on, Isaac is getting old, he's kind of blind, he can't see, he tells Esau, go out and go hunting and get, kill a deer, a venison, and bring it back and cook my favorite dish, my favorite food, and bring it to me and I will bless you and put my hand on you and, 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 and God's blessings will be upon you. And his mother, Rebecca, overhears it and while he's out hunting, Rebecca says, Jacob, come here, sweetheart. We've got to do something, we've got to do something fast. Your blessing's about to be lost. Esau's a good hunter, very skilled. It won't take him long. You go get the goat, and you go in, and you get the blessing from your dad. He said, Mom, Dad knows I'm not Esau. I don't smell like Esau. I don't feel like Esau. I don't talk like Esau. She said, Don't worry about that. Just do what I tell you to do. And you know what he did. He went in there, put goat skin on. Dad felt the hair of the goat and smelled the garments of Esau. And he said, are you really Esau? He said, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Because he wanted the blessing. Listen, the blessing that he already had. Mm -hmm. 
You know what mom should have said? Son, don't worry about that. When you were in my womb, I asked the Lord, Lord, what's going on inside here? And He spoke to me and said, the younger, the elder shall serve the younger. I don't care what your daddy does. I don't care what Esau does. I don't care what anybody does. God said this and it can't change. So you trust Him to work it out. But she wouldn't trust Him either, would she? So He deceives here. We don't have time this morning, but He reaps what He sows when He goes to His father's home uh, area where relatives are and He serves Laban. And Laban keeps changing everything. And now, now the manipulator is getting manipulated. Right? And then it comes time, God says, go back. Go back to your dad and them. And, and, and Jacob has met with God already. And to meet Esau, he sends out some servants and he finds he's coming. 400 men are coming with him. When I left, stealing the birthright, he said, when daddy dies, I'm going to kill you. So he's bringing 400 men to end my life. And so this is what Jacob does. I've got to fix this. I, 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 this is what I'll do. I'll set three groups out and I'll send them to Esau. And with those groups, I'll offer him gifts every time they come. And if he kills that group, then another group will come and give gifts and kill them. Then another group is going to come and, and he'll get gifts from them. And maybe by the time he's through killing everybody, when he gets to me, he might not want to kill me. Or... Either the gifts will maybe turn his heart and he'll say, man, I've got so much out of him, I don't need to kill him. Look at all this I've got. What is he doing in that? He's still trusting Jacob. He's still trusting Jacob's way of getting things and working it out, getting an advantage and putting it in his favor. He's still doing his best to obtain something that's already his. I thought a lot of times, you know how we do that. In many areas of our life, we spend a lot of time when God has already given us a promise about something, trying to work that out ourselves when what God really wants us to do is just trust Him. Right. Jacob had a hard time learning how to trust the Lord. Even after he saw God at Penol, he slept there, made the rock the pillar, and met with God. Even after that, he wrestles with God in the tent, face to face, he still has a hard time just trusting God and believing God and knowing that God is going to do what he said he would do. There are many areas that I thought about when I think about Jacob. One is in the area of salvation. People do the same thing when it comes to being saved. They're always trying to work out their own salvation. The Lord Jesus Christ came uh, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and was born of the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless, perfect life only to go to a cruel cross, lay that life down for your sins and my sins on Calvary's hill, and through his death, burial, and thank God his resurrection, all that will come to Jesus by faith and receive him, they have eternal life. The price has already been paid. The gift has already been offered. Salvation is available to whoever will come and call upon the name of the Lord. But you know, instead of coming and calling on the name of the Lord, a lot of people continue to try to earn their own way to heaven. Is that true or not? Yes. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 26, He said the, this blood was shed for the remission or forgiveness of sins. When He passed that cup around, He said, My blood is going to be shed so that you can have remission of your sin. That is, yes. forgiveness and deliverance. Yes. Look up the word remission. Forgiveness, but also deliverance. And instead of receiving this great, wonderful gift of salvation, many people do exactly what Jacob did. They work for it. They fight for it. They war after it. They desire it. But as James said in James chapter 4, they can't attain it. 
I mean, they burn candles, they, they climb stairs, they, they eat certain diets, they pray at certain times, and even in the church that have preached Christ for years, there are people in there that keep trying to earn or deserve salvation, and as long as you think you can save yourself, you're going to stay lost. You're never going to be saved doing what Jacob did. Right. Fighting and, and trying and striving and working things out and hoping and desiring. You're going to end up in hell. Right. The only thing you can do is to receive salvation as the free gift that God has given. Amen. And by the way, the Bible talks about this many cases, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift of God, the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's an Old Testament example of salvation. And Jesus used it in John chapter 3. It's found in Numbers chapter 21. Verse 4 says, The soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way, hard, difficult traveling, and they spoke against God. They murmured and complained. And by the way, this wasn't the first time they murmured and complained. They compl murmured and complained a lot. And what was God's judgment in Numbers 21? Anybody remember that? He sent in fiery serpents, and they bit them. And many died. And so Moses goes to God and he says, God, what can we do? Help us. And God says, I'll tell you what to do. You take a, a brazen serpent, you put it on a pole, and you lift it up, and whoever looks at that serpent will be healed of the serpent bite. So Moses makes the brazen serpent, puts it on a pole, is walking through the camp, and all they have to do to live, all they have to do to survive, to be healed, is just look. My father-in-law used to preach a message on this. He said, he said, I know what some people did. Some people said, it can't be that easy. You're going to waste your time. You're waiting around here to look at a, a serpent on a pole. Nobody's ever been healed by looking at a serpent on a pole. Let's go out and get some herbs. and Let's try to, let's try to get this fixed up. And let's suck the poison out. Let's elevate the leg. There's a lot of stuff we can do. But looking at a pole ain't going to help. You know what happened to those people? They died. You put any potion on there you want to. You, you treat it any way you like. You're going to die. Unless you do what? Believe, believe what God said. Look at the serpent on the pole. And then you'll be healed. Right? Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What do I need to do to be saved? Look to Jesus and live. Put your faith in Christ and live. Trust Christ and live. Believe on Christ. There's nothing you can do other than that. And anything else, you're just wasting your time and you might drop off into hell because you're trying to gain something that's already been provided. Just by putting your faith and trust in Jesus. Amen? But Christians, it, it doesn't stop there. It happens to us all the time as well. In the conquering of sin. In Romans chapter 6, we're told these words, that if we, we died with Christ, we were buried with Christ, and we rose with Christ, and since we died with Christ, we are free from sin. You say, preacher, come on now. Can I say something to you? That's not what I said. <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't have to trust in my word, but you do have to trust in His word. Amen? Right. Many of you right now would say this morning, Preacher, I hate sin. I struggle against sin. I fight it. I war. I desire victory over sin, but I can't obtain it. I don't want to sin, but I sin. I want to live a holy life, but I don't live a holy life. 
What is wrong with me? Nothing. You need some help to understand something, but every Christian in here has fought that same battle. By the way, and we are fighting that same battle even now. Every single one of us. You know what the Apostle Paul said about himself in Romans chapter 7? He said, when I, do, when I want to do good, I do wrong. And when I try to do what's right, I end up doing the wrong thing. And when I, I, I want to do good, but I do bad. I want to live right, but I end up living wrong. What is wrong with me? Now listen, that's my paraphrase. That's, and by the way, since there's so many other versions out there, that's just as good as the other one, right? And it's probably more accurate than them too. What's wrong with me? Who can help me? And he says, Jesus is the only one that can help me. And then he goes into Romans chapter 8. That now there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh. Amen? Amen. So what does Romans chapter 6 say? It says these words right here. Verse 6 and 7. Know, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that is Jesus, crucified with Jesus Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Why? That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. And, and the question always echoes back, and preacher, why am I having a problem with it? There's only two reasons that you have a problem with it. Reason number one, you have not reckoned that to be true. When you read that, I'm free. Yes. I don't have to sin. You said, but it's pulling, it's strong, it's powerful. That's what the devil's telling you. Exactly. you That's not what God said. God. He said, preacher, I've tried and I failed. I, I still, that's not what God said. That's not what he said. What, what you've got to do is say here in verse 11, he said, count this to be true in your life. Yes. Mark it down. Yes. If you have to write it out. Yes. You, I believe that what God said is true. I died with Christ and I have victory over sin. Listen, and you're never going to really be victorious until you get a hold of that truth. Yes, yes. amen. Amen. Exactly. That's what he said, and that's what I'm standing on. Now, let, let me ask you how many, how many of you had to just like stand on a promise? Just because God said it. Exactly. And there was nothing else to stand on. That's all right. You, listen, every one of us should have our hands up. Because when it comes to salvation, guess what we're all doing? Standing we're standing on a promise. That's, right. That's what God said. That's what he said. And when I drop off into eternity, I'm dropping off trusting, he said. Tommy, if you'll, if you'll call on me, I'll see you. You're doing that. So why not do that with these sin issues that you're facing? Why not, why not say, Lord, I believe this. I don't understand it. I don't feel it. Everything in me seems to be contrary to what you're saying here. But I know that you're right and I'm wrong. Yes, yes, exactly. I, I, I may not understand it, but I want you to open my eyes to it. I've got to get a hold of it. Yes, yes. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Would you even spend some time praying? About, at least pray about these passages and say, God, what does that mean? Because exactly. if, it, if, it, if it sounds as good as what it sounds like here, I am very interested in that. Aren't you? I mean, I'm interested in victory over sin, aren't you? So, so what you have to do is say, now listen, this is true. And this is what this means, by the way. When I receive Christ, I die to this world. The things here, the pleasures, the sins, this life, all this world. When I die, I die to all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now I'm risen with Christ and I'm in Christ. And now my life is to be for Christ. Yeah, amen. And, and I plead with you to reckon that. Go back, go back and say, listen, I don't I may not understand it, but when I bat when I was baptized, I pictured that. I pictured myself dying with Christ. I pictured myself being raised with Christ. That's what the Bible says. That's what I have to believe. And I'm going to reckon it. I'm going to consider it to be true. And I'm going to stand on the promises of it. And the second reason, 
that we don't experience this deliverance from sin is because we keep yielding to the wrong voice. person. The voice. Yes, exactly. He says in verse 13, Yield not your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Exactly. He said, you, you died to this world, but this is what you're doing. You're taking these hands and you're putting them back in the world. Exactly. And you're taking these eyes and you're putting them back in the world. And you're taking these feet and you're walking back into the world. Mm-hmm. And you're taking your heart and, and you get you, you, you let the world get a hold of your heart. And, and if you don't ever start saying no to the flesh yeah. because I'm dead to that yeah. and yes to God because I'm yielding to that, you're going to fight and fight and fight and lose and lose and fight and lose and win some and fight and lose and lose and fight and win some. And that'll be your Christian life. Mm-hmm. Listen, you've got to make up your mind. I cannot have the world and Jesus. That's right. That's right. By the way, I'm I'm right in the same pot with y'all. I'm, I, I mean, this work we live in it. We 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 wake up in it. We we have to do business in it. There's no way to get out of this world, right? The danger is being pulled back into it. You know, we used to preach and teach that folks should not go to the movies. And why did why did churches say that? Because when you go to the movies and you sit down, guess what they're doing? They're indoctrinating you. <laughs> You're sitting in the world's class. And it's a fun class. Right? I mean, the sounds, the sights, uh, the thrill. I mean, it's a fun class. And all the time, they're teaching you and they're indoctrinating you. And you've seen it more now than ever, had not you? Yeah. When's the last time a, a, a movie has come out that they don't have some transgender or homosexual character in there? TV. When's the last time they put a TV, uh, new series on TV they didn't have a transgender or uh, uh, openly homosexual person on that show? Can y'all think of one? What are they doing? Trying to get you to get used to the dark. Now listen, if they're doing that, if they're doing that, what else are they doing? You say, preacher, I'm struggling. Of course you are. You come to church, maybe 30 minutes. By the way, I'm not just saying this. We can get another adult Sunday school teacher but none of y'all should have missed Sunday school this morning. <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm talking. <laughs> Nobody should have missed Sunday school this morning. It was better than our preaching service. You can't get much <laughs> You can't get much better than that. <laughs> uh, it, it was just helpful. It was very instructive. You could learn a lot. But I'm saying this. You can't come to church for 30 minutes or an hour and a half or two hours and then go back out in this world and there's cussing at work and there's just wicked music over the, over the uh, microphones, uh, speakers, and, there, and there's uh, in your home there's worldliness and ungodliness and out in the street there's people wanting you to do sin and wrong and everywhere you go it's like having a... a a white suit on and you're in a coal mine. (laughs) And you do the best you can and then you get out in the light and you see, I tried not to touch anything. Look, I'm still a mess. Is that right? (laughs) What you need is more of the Word. What you need is more time with Jesus. I I mentioned that someone... What do you want me to do? Preach your read my Bible 24 hours a day, seven days, seven days a week, if you need to. Some of you would do that to get a degree in, in nursing or engineering. You do that. You step all night, make sure you're ready for the test. And and someone said, "What are you doing?" Well, I got a big test. I want to make sure I do good on this. Well, when's the last time you did that with the Bible? And you say, preacher, I'm just not doing well. Well, how much are you in the Word? When is the last time you got a hold of Jesus? Yes. Glory. Glory. Oh, hallelujah. 
Not just. You know, I, gotta, I gotta read these verses. I gotta pray this prayer, and you know, I'm out the door. Nope. I, I hope made at least one thing. <laughs> if you do that Monday, you put the brakes on. And say, well, wait a minute. I'm here anyway. I need to meet with God. Amen. Amen. I need to get a hold of the Lord. Yes. Right. So what are they? What are they doing wrong? They haven't said, Lord, that's true. What you said is true. I died with Christ. And I've been resurrected in Christ. In fact, I'm sitting right now in heavenly places in Christ. Christ. I'm a part of His body. I have His Holy Spirit living inside of me. You may be more than a conqueror through Him that loved me. Greater is He that's in me than He that's in the world. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Without Him, I can't do anything. But with Him, I can do all things. What's missing? You're doing exactly what Jacob did. You have power over sin. You've got victory in Christ. He has truly set you free. But you know what you're doing? You're trying to figure out your own way. Like, well, you know what? If I, if I just discipline myself here, if I just, I got to make this commitment. I got to make this decision. If I can just get people watching me, if they hold me accountable, I tell you, that's good. But let, let me tell you something. Nobody can hold you accountable like Jesus. Right. You know why? He's the only one that knows everything. Yeah. Even your accountability partner. Yeah. He's better than Come on now. Yeah. He don't know everything because you won't tell him everything. That's right. That's right. That is the truth. Now, I have, we had a sister that used to come to church here, went to Catholic church, and my pastor asked her, he said, when you got in that confessional booth, did you tell him everything? She said, why, no, preacher. <laughs> I didn't tell him everything. But there's a God that sees in the dark. That's right. That's right. He knows what nobody else knows. He knows. And the only way to get things right is to be right with him and be concerned. He sees me. I don't want to hurt my fellowship with him. And I need to be careful about what I do. But if you continue to ignore Jesus, you're going to continue to struggle. Amen? I'm just trying to tell you the truth. He said, Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but what? But yield yourselves unto God. What does that mean? What that means is I take these eyes and I put them in this book. And I, and I stop putting them on just fun, entertaining. Man, I like this game. I like this movie. I like this TV series. There, there's some people that are Christians that if you told them they could never watch a certain TV series again, they would just be devastated. Uh-huh. What? <laughs> Tell that same Christian you can never read your Bible again. They say, well, okay. I hate that, but, uh, you know, <laughs> it happens. Something's wrong on the inside, right? right. Take these eyes and get them in this book. Yes, amen. Take these ears and listen to this book. Yes, yes. Take these hands and do something for Jesus. Amen. Use these feet to serve Jesus in some way. Yes. You've got to stop focusing your life on just these temporal things and say, God, this, you, you have indwelt this body to be used in this world to do the will of Christ, so God, use it to accomplish that. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you, we don't have time this morning. But... When it comes to even to the fullness of the Holy Spirit, that's right. I used to hear about being filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. So I, I would uh, fast and I read books on the Holy Spirit, and then I, I would say, well, maybe I'm not doing this, maybe I'm not doing that, and, and where's all this power everybody's talking about? And and Lord, you you said in your Word, and you know what the truth is? This is the truth. I have as much of the Holy Spirit as I'll ever have. You know what the problem is? He does not have as much as, of me as He can ever have. When I'm full of the Holy Spirit, that means He is fully taking charge of every aspect of my life. Now listen, there's power that comes from God. I'm not, I'm not dismissing that. But I'm saying to, to, to do what the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, he said, Be not drunk with wine, for it is excess, but what? Be filled with the Spirit.
Spirit. Listen, and, he, and the words, words there, you look at them. It is be being filled. Always under His control and in His influence. Yes, Useful at any moment. Yes. What? The Holy Spirit. What? Is all of you. And he has, listen, when He has all of you, you'll be full of Him. Yes, that's right. That at the new birth, I received the Holy Spirit. Just like you did. At the new birth, I received the Holy Spirit just like you did. Amen? Amen. And there have been times I've yielded myself to Him. And He spoke to me. And He'd say, Tommy, go talk to that person about being saved. Or He'd lay something heavy upon my heart. Or He'd direct me in some other way. And that's the same thing He wants to do for every one of you. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. But that's not something that you're going to earn. Listen to me. And it never will be something that you deserve. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Amen. You can't. I mean, you, you, it, it is something that God does in your life. It's not the work of the flesh. It, it, it's not even in church. It's not trying to get a certain atmosphere. It's God showing up and doing only what God can do. Amen? Amen. You can't manipulate it. You can't, you can't deceive others about it. It's either something God does or it's never going to be done. Amen? That's right. That's right. By the way, many of these things are things that we already have. Amen. You can go to heaven if you're lost. You can leave this service, your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, heaven being your eternal home, by coming this morning and saying, Jesus, you're the only way to get there. That's right. And I want you to save me and forgive me my Amen. sins. You, Make me one of yours. Amen? Amen? And you don't have to pray those exact words. I think there have been people saved that didn't say anything near that. They just said, God, I want you. I need you. Save me. Amen? Amen. Uh, but I'm telling you this. You're never going to be victorious over your uh, sin issues until you start doing what Romans chapter 6 says. That's right. And you know what happens after, after a period of victory? This is a dangerous time. I told uh, Sister Wilhelmina after our revival, I said, this is a dangerous time. Yes. And by the way, I want you to look around. Because mm-hmm. some people have been affected. When God shows up and He meets with His people, boy, it's just so exciting. Yes. And then after that, a very dangerous time. Yes, it is. Why? Because the spiritual high is over. And you get back down to living consistently for Christ. Yes. And you say, well, what's wrong with me? Nothing, Nothing wrong with you. Yield to God. Believe His Word and see what God will do. Amen? Amen. There is not a sin in this world Christ can't deliver you from. And by the way, when He said He set you free, what did He say about being free? You are free indeed. You don't just say, oh, I I think I am, I believe I am, I hope I am. No, you are. Now you have to trust Christ to be that, that daily experience for that freedom. Amen? Amen. Do y'all see, at least do you see the point this morning? Here's Jacob. He's just trying everything he has got to get a blessing that's already his. We make the same mistake over and over again. Religious people working their selves through the bone trying to get to heaven. When Jesus said, here's a gift, take it. And Christian people really struggling hard against doing wrong and evil. When Christ says, listen, I've set you free. Come to me and you can have victory. Isn't that right? And if God's dealt with your heart about something this morning, you respond to him, please. Let's pray. Let's stand and pray. Father, in Jesus' name, help us today.